Hey everyone, nice to be here. Uh, nice to you know, nice to see friends in the audience and new friends in the audience. Uh, it's a you know it's a great atmosphere. You know, I, I'm actually going to be talking about this. That there's a there's a there's a, a tremendous collaboration and you know communication in this community, and that's that that can only have a positive outcome. So it's it's really great to see that. All right, so there's kind of three sections to what I'll be talking about. One is just a bit about my journey, which is fairly minimal. Uh, and then, um, uh, by request, I've been asked to talk about how we, how we um, talk about and weight different target markets when you're considering how to launch and where to launch. And then some observations I've made about some pitfalls. I mean, since I've been back, I've somehow seen a lot of decks. I've seen, I don't know, something in the tens anyway. And I've seen a few common threads there. Obviously, there's a lot of excellent uh, attributes to the companies, but there's been a few pitfalls and commonalities, and I'm just um, putting a, a, a voice to those. So that's, that's kind of the structure. So this is me, <laughs> just so you know. Uh, let's kick off. So part one is who is this guy? Part two is uh, a Silicon Valley way of selecting your target market, and then some common pitfalls. And this is an unintended word wrap, but that's OK. All right, <clears throat> so a bit of background about myself. Um, uh, the last day job, really, that I had was uh, working at ERG Group, I was, which was, oddly enough, run by Peter Fogarty when he was still uh, amassing his, uh, his uh, wealth that now he's um, uh, being a benefactor for. Um, and uh, uh, I was reporting to the CTO. Uh, I, I ended up finishing my MBA while I was at ERG. And so I ended up being the guy who was <clears throat> running the numbers on what, whether a specific kind of uh, product would be economic and would it be economic in different areas on different projects and how do we value and how do we quantify these things. Um, and end up being a little frustrating because uh, once I remember I was saying, well, you know, there's two different options here. This one has a pretty good chance of overrunning and there's liquidated damages. And this one is a little bit more expensive, but it wouldn't overrun. And uh, I remember them saying, well, the thing is, you know, why don't these numbers add up? I go, oh, well, it's because there's discounted capital. It's, dis it's discounted cash flows. And they said, oh, no, we're not going to be doing any discounting. <laughs> no, 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 that's off the table. We'll go with this version. So anyway, so I ended up advising a few different startups. The first I was an, um, a significant advisor for and then became a, a founder, co-founder, was a company called Exact Steel, which on the surface actually, I'm not going to spend too long talking about this, on the surface had very good fundamentals, but ultimately the capital wasn't there. That's a very simple summary. And that was the end of that, because there was no capital. Boom. But uh, <clears throat> what I found was that I, I had to research a lot about iron ore. And I realized that the price of iron ore was going to skyrocket. And so I started investing in, in a mining town, knowing that this was going to happen. But, and when I say this, by the way, I just want to make a point about this, that this is a, a common thread, and it's not just me. I think anyone who's you know, had something, had, had things go right, it's been a kind of, the un underlying thing is something about obsession, right? So I say I invested in a mining town, but actually I was looking at everything. I really wanted to invest in something that would have strong positive cash flow that would allow me then to look for other deals, where I didn't have to have a, a day job. Like that, that was really very important. And so I remember that there was a long, this is just case in point, there was a long weekend, and I took off also the Thursday and the Tuesday, and I just spent five days looking. I said, well, I don't know where the good real estate deals are. I will look at every deal. And I just took the West Australian with a red pen, and I analyzed everything. Like there's, I forgot what it was, there's thousands, there's tens of thousands. And I thought, look, this is the only way I'm going to find out. And I was just, I was that obsessive. <laughs> anyway, so that's, that was, and that, that just went on, on and on. And when I found this, I knew all about the iron ore. And it, yeah, anyway, so that's, that's where that came from. That, uh, it, so it looks like it was, it was, it was, it, it was um, hard won luck, I would call it. OK, oh, that, will, that all jumped quite nicely. OK, so long story short, oh, that didn't work right properly. Long story short, it did go well. The, the income from the rents provided uh, like a retainer for me to then start looking around at opportunities. And the first, there was a few things. There was a radio station, a leverage buyout of a telecommunication uh, company, the, a bid that I put together. And I bought this, a company with two others called Electroacoustic, 50-person company. 
that was basically providing, well, among other things, hospital instrumentation. Um, but this also belies the fact that it took me one or two, uh, took me about two years of looking at probably over like, 200 companies. Every single business broker in this town hated me because I was going to them every week. What is there? Let me have a look, analyzing everything. I also realized, even though I had a, this relatively newly minted MBA, how little I knew about financial analysis, even though I thought I did MBA in finance, I realized it doesn't teach you everything. Anyway, so that belies the fact that um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I just happened to buy this company. Uh, it was just services, and we were buying a product. Uh, we, were, we were buying a product from someone and adding a little bit of value with labor and on selling it. Uh, and we changed that into a product company. So actually uh, created our own line of products, went to Southeast Asia, set up some supply lines. Um, and long story short, we became market leader. It cost us only about 11% of the cost of what we were buying it for when we bought our own. But it was a superior product. It was plug compatible with its competitors. And it, it ate the market alive, I'm proud to say. Anyway, so when, as that was going to sell, and it looked like it was going down that road, uh, I was selected for a Silicon Valley, what was called the Silicon Valley Immersion Program. It doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. Um, uh, so I went to the Valley. I learned for six months how the Valley works. This is at a time in 2008 where you just couldn't get that information. Right now it's in a million books and there's Founder Institute and there's accelerators and it's all proliferated, which is wonderful and how it should be. But at the time, that was the only way, place to actually get this kind of knowledge. And after the program, I ended up working with Selby Ventures. The biggest deal that I was adamant that uh, they invest and, and do follow-in uh, funding for uh, was Pandora, which ended up IPOing for, I think, 3.6 billion at the time. And Selby was one of the largest, um, one of the largest uh, shareholders. Uh, so that, that was something that I was adamant that they did. And so that was very nice. And after that, um, I ended up advising various VC firms and accelerators. And uh, fast forward, I've been really advising ever since. Uh, I've lectured at Stanford in continuing studies. Um, I'm still in EIR at Bootstrap Labs, which is a VC firm in the Valley. Um, EIR standing for expert in resident, not entrepreneur in residence. Different E. Um, and I've just been made an industry fellow of UC Berkeley. And I'm flying back there next month. So I'm kind of foot here and, and, and foot, foot still in the valley. Uh, and happy to talk about all of that in the Q&A. Um, about three years ago, I started Stratica Labs, which is an AI company that does instant expert business insight. And that is, it's created a, a breakthrough in financial analysis, kind of based on when I was looking at all these hundreds of companies and realizing that I just didn't know how to interpret them. It was right there in front of me. I didn't know how to interpret it. So, now I have some, we've built something that can do that, and it can do it at scale. So we've signed two national deals. We have a pipeline of 120, a pipeline of customers that themselves have $120 billion assets under management. So that's a work in progress that's interesting. I'm still a significant shareholder there, and I talk to the team every evening and have a call with them tonight. Okay, so that's, that's back, that background about me. I want to talk about the five Oh, any questions on any of that before I jump forward? Okay. Yeah, I have a question. Yes, please. Why did you come back to Perth? <laughs> well, I'm here and I'm over there. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, no, I have a three-year-old now, and you know, she she didn't get to know her family. Um, you know, my family are here, and now you know it's just an absolute joy seeing her with my with my dad and you know extended family. Oh, yeah. You worked at Honeywell for a while. I did. Yes. Yeah. RBI. Oh, yes, I did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I did uh, Y2K at BP. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll ask you later. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Do you still have your uh, mining town investments? Or did you, uh... I do. They absolutely tanked for years, and it was <laughs> negative cash flow. It was brutal. And now they're back. But they're not back at the same level. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, Five main factors. Uh, so, okay. so uh, Trent, I, I sent a whole list of things I could talk about to Trent. And uh, w one thing that, that he suggested was just talking about, the, well, the, 
the Silicon Valley method for selecting the initial target market. Uh, Dave, feel free to jump in if you see anything as well. Um, it's not the Silicon Valley way, it's a Silicon Valley way. Um, but this is what I've seen, and that is, this, I'm going to talk about it qualitatively and then quantitatively. So firstly, you're selecting for um, a, um, a target market that has extreme customer pain. That word extreme has to, it's, this isn't an academic <laughs> exercise here. Um, it has to be, uh, the, the technology that you have has to be suitable for it. Uh, it's got to be a really attractive solution. Uh, it needs to have a, a high internal impact and you've got to be able to do it. And I want to go into detail here. So with customer pain, you want customers who are experiencing an extreme level of pain. It's not, yeah, that'd be nice. You know, we, you know, we talk about vitamin pill versus painkiller and even painkillers are ranked. You don't want to waste your life on something that's a nice to have. You really want to target something that's extreme. And each of these factors, by the way, we're going to wait in a second. In two slides time, we're going to wait these all. You multiply them all out together. So the next thing is, it's not enough that they're in pain. They've got to be open to a solution. Because a lot of customers are going, well, we hate it, but that's just it. That's just how it is. You know, what about this other? No, no, we've learned it now. It's awful, but, we but that's just how it is. And you never want to be changing behavior, by the way. Um, so this is an equal factor. So in terms of technology suitability, can the core of your technology do this? Or have you got to write, completely write something else? And, uh, and this is something that's significant. I talk about this later. And that is, can it be suitably solved with existing technologies? Like blockchain is my favorite example. Because a lot of blockchain applications can just be solved with a VPN or a really good database. So, and, and, that, and that's a better solution because it's cheaper and it exists and everyone's comfortable with it. It's not as sexy, by the way. Some, you know, it's arguable whether blockchain is sexy anymore. Anyway, so this is a really important point. Okay, so in a solution attractiveness. In the solution that you're thinking of to this pain, is there a high frequency of revenue events? Are they buying once a year because it's a, a Father Christmas sack? Or is it toothpaste? Toothpaste is a bad example, but something that are people buying the virtual goods t three times a day, or they buy it once because it's a Christmas hat or on a Santa game or something. And the other is, are you getting high or low revenue per transaction? And each of these is, we're going to weight these factors one to three. Uh, and then lastly, and I, I underestimated this to my detriment, and that is, you want to choose something that has a fast sp speed of sales cycle. You can worry later on in, in future segments about, um, uh, about slower sales cycles. But when you're learning, when you don't even know what you've got, you can't select something that has a slow learning cycle. In fact, the learning part is more important than the sales cycle. If it takes you a long time to learn, you'll never find out in time. And then you'll lose your capital and your team, and it's over. So the speed of learning is actually absolutely vital. OK. So then some internal factors. So with the solution that you're thinking of for your specific team, it, what is the level of technology risk? Do you have to create new engineering? Do you have to discover a new algorithm? Or is it just a matter of you put a skin on, make it blue, and make something flash, and make it look like the logo of your client, and it's done? Like what level of technology risk? And similarly, what level of execution risk? Anything that isn't technology. And lastly, internal capability, and these are all factors in selecting your target market because this will be diff these will all be different for different target markets. Um, the ability of your, of your team, your team, to offer something that few others can, can do. So one is the ability of your team to do it, like maybe the solution is a quantum computing solution, except none of you know anything about quantum computing. So that's too bad, you've got a natural disadvantage immediately and offer something that few others can match. Because if everyone else can do it, like that database example, then yeah, great, you've offered a great solution, and so could every other IT graduate on the planet. So that's obviously um, a clear weighting. And also, the ability for your team to reach the right people, say in banking, can you reach banking executives, or can you reach advertising executives? Um, and can you reach them at a scale? Can you reach a critical number of prospects? Because if you can reach two, that's awesome. But if you can't reach them at scale, if you don't have a tangible way to connect the dots 
to get to 100 million revenue, recurring revenue per year five, which by the way, that's, that, that's the goal we'll talk about in a second, um, then, then that's a negative weighting. Oh yeah, anyway, so, right, so each of these, each of these are, um, you know, each of these are weightings, and then just being the engineer that I am, but I, I didn't invent this, you know, we, you actually just multiply them out. And so, you know, you take each of these, and here's an example here, and for each of these, you give it either one to three or one to four. Don't do one to 10. Why would you not do one to 10? Anyone know? You wouldn't do one to 10 because the level of uncertainty is too high. You only know low, medium, or high, or four different grades at this level without going in. You don't want analysis by paralysis, whichever. You know, so the only, the data, the information resolution is really crude. So don't, don't give it artificial levels of, you know, level of depth. Okay, so we rank it one to two. Uh, yeah, sorry, one, one to three, and then we multiply them all out, and then you, this will tell you, according to your own criteria and your own weightings, what areas you should focus on. And in practice, the way that, and by the way, obviously I've seen this in textbooks that there's, maybe there's two or three of these. You don't necessarily want two or three. That's actually misguiding. You want all the factors, these and probably more. If it's 100, it's 100. If it's five, it's five. I mean, th these are pretty good, uh, what I've found, but, the point is, you, I mean, you definitely want these. There could be others as well. Um, I mean, I, I actually took a few away because they were specific to some other industries to, to, to do this presentation. Um, but, but anyway, but what, I, what happens in practice is a few of them you go, oh, of course. But then there's a few you go, really? According to this, this one, this fact, this, this segment is, 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 is a target. And so what it does is, who cares what the number is? What matters is the order, right? And, and the, the level of magnitude. And in this example, obviously I took this from something else. Halal food integrity clearly is twice as important. I mean, you just want to weight this roughly, right? And that's the point. Then you look in more detail. But that's how you weight these things. Any questions on any of, of this? You're assuming all the factors are identical in their weighting. Oh yeah. Aren't you? Yeah, I yeah. am. Yeah, yeah, so you could change that. I, I, I don't generally. That's deep though. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was also thinking that when I was putting this slide together, I thought, well, I, I've done it this way. Um, but also, you, you also, it's, it's generally what you want is to, for the more attractive segments to bubble to the top. Okay, so now I want to talk about, um, just common WA venture traps. Uh, and this is in a few different segments. So the deck, venture level, strategy level, and product level. So first, I, wanna, I don't want to just stand here and say all the things I've seen. I also want to say what's good, because there's a lot of in really strong things I've seen. So the first is that, like, uh, and, and, and Dave will be able to no, no doubt agree with me here. Like when you go to a lot of Aussie events with new coming Australian ventures and people will compare the Australian culture to Silicon Valley culture. And they'll say, well, in the Australian culture, what happens is that people won't share their networks and they won't be helpful. And when you come to the Valley, everyone's helpful and you can always get a coffee with someone and you can always... Actually, I've not found that here. I didn't find it in WA before I left for the Valley and I haven't found it since. Actually, everyone is like they are in the Valley in that everyone is... Oh, and it's not just myself, it's also my wife who's in high technology lending, you know, and she's found this, this as well. So there's two strong data points that, you know, people are actively helpful. And by the way, that, that is only positive, right? The ability that everyone's trying to be active and helpful and think, oh, you should talk to so-and-so. That's actually absolute gold for, for an ecosystem. So the other is, there's not a lot of, uh, there's trivial technology everywhere in the world. But what I've seen is that proportionately, there's actually a lot of smart, non-trivial technology here. There's a lot of deep tech. There's, it's in med tech, it's in uh, ag tech. There's actually a lot of substantial meaty technology, as Charlie will be able to test, right? It's actually, it's a lot there. And as a, as a roughly speaking, as a percentage of ventures, I, I would argue, I don't have any data on this, but I think there's more deep tech here than there would be over in the valley where Snap, Snapchats and et cetera reign, you know, that they're one of the, the uh, success modes <laughs> for startups. 
Decks are quite visual, which is very good. I have a complaint about decks, which I'll come to later. Um, but, but the decks at least are very visual, and that's, that's actually a good thing. Um, and there's a genuine culture, right? The, like, here, it's, it's normal just to be yourself, and you know, if you're not smiling all the time, like I'm not smiling all the time, people here aren't smiling all the time, but I know that they're happy, <laughs> generally, I hope, <laughs> whatever. <clears throat> Whereas over in the valley, there's more a tendency that people just have to always show that they're happy. I mean, it's, you know, it's, and it's not a, it's not, I'm not sure what it is. It's not disingenuous. It's just that they, people are worried about upsetting someone, so they always have to smile, you know. Um, whereas here, you know, the, the values of being true blue, it's just ingrained, in, we're born with this stuff. And there are actually, there are workshops you can go to to be genuine, <laughs> which I find bizarre. Um, yeah. Okay. And also, there are influential, as we've seen today, right? There's influential prime movers who genuinely want to make a difference here. And that's, that's really, really positive. You know, when you, when you roll the camera forward, like when you roll this picture forward, you know, we, we become a much stronger you know, ecosystem uh, by people who are you know, significant prime movers who are really trying to make a difference. So that's really positive. And this is accretive as well. Uh, okay, so down to th uh, observations I've made. This isn't every deck or every company, but these are some common things I've seen <clears throat> and therefore things to avoid. So when you do your deck, what I've <clears throat> this is just some uh, suggestion. You want to say what it is you do right away, ideally in five words. We are Uber for dog food or something, right? Straight away, so that immediately you get the aha moment and then the rest of the deck is fleshing that out. Because what you don't want is that you've got this amazing opportunity to pitch to some customers or investors or a group of potential employees or anything, and, or the media, whichever. <clears throat> and the whole pitch, they don't know what it is actually that you do, and then you finish it, oh yeah, but what we're doing is we're, we, whichever. Because they spent the whole time all, not listening to you, wondering what it is that you do. Um, so the next is to quantify that pain. You really want to define define the pain, define the size of the market, decide the, the size of the market where people are experiencing that pain, and you want to turn the knife to really show why it's painful. Uh, this, is my, this is my pet hate. This happens in the valley, but I've seen it, and I, I've seen it um, very much more so here. And I've also seen it with, with Aussie companies that come like through Startmate or whichever come up to the valley, that they're what I call like essay slides, where it's like tw 10 or 12 point font, just filling, filling the slide, which is not helpful. Because as you can see here, I'm talking a lot. And you're, you may or may not have read these words. But it, and this is, this is 32 point font. You can imagine if it was 12 point, you'd have no, no hope. Anyway, so it only distracts. Um, a clear narrative for the deck. You know, I have seen a lot of decks that do have a clear narrative, but you do want something that's, that's, that's concise and tight, and that's, it, it's, the, the flow is clear. Um, and say how you'll make money. Yeah, I have absolutely seen decks that say this, but I've also seen a lot that don't. And you're selling yourself short if you're not saying, if you're not making money yet, that's okay, but say how you plan to make more money. Um, and something that isn't on here since I submitted uh, this afternoon, uh, and that is, Early on, it's all about the team. And yet, the number of decks I've seen that don't emphasize, and was it websites as well, and sophisticated websites, that don't emphasize the team. It's all about the team. And you know, it's, it's because the product is going to change, the technology is going to change, the customer is probably going to change. The team are the guys who've got to go, oh, we're off track. We've got to go, oh, look at that. This, this customer is even more valuable than that customer, whichever, you know, this, this direction. So it's all about the team. If your team is really strong, put it as high up as possible. If you're recent university graduates, no one here, um, then you know, put it further down. But you really need to show it, and in as few words as possible. Log logos, ideally. You know, just three, anyway. But this isn't a how-to on decks, by the way. It's just an obs observations. OK. Oh, so <clears throat> any questions on, on this observation? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and, and, and even more so, right? Because if it's just you, then you, know, you want to, who is this guy? 
Why is this guy going to, why is this guy the guy who's going to do it? And so you want to put like the, the three greatest achievements that are aligned with what it is that you're trying to work on. And just as few, every extra word is not welcome on a deck. Take every, avoid every unnecessary word and, re and remove the word unnecessary, <laughs> right? <laughs> Okay, so <clears throat> now at the venture level. Okay, I've said this a few times. Say it in five words. Whatever it is your company does or organization does, boil that down to five words. And this is the reason why. Because even though like, a, lot, a lot of real advances in, for your company come to conversations like this, in either formal or informal conversations where a friend or a potential customer or a colleague or anyone says, oh, uh, what is it that you do? And if you, can, if you can boil that down into five simple words, then they go, oh, you know who you should talk to? What did I just do? Oh, I got too excited. Um, oh, you know who you should talk to? You should talk to John over there. John, does, John knows all about blockchain. Oh, yeah, Jenny knows all about uh, solar cells. You should talk to her. Those sorts of introductions become vital. And it's heartbreaking to see a lot of um, Aussie companies come up to the valley and then you, know, you see them like we're on the last couple of days and you go, oh, well, what do you, what do you guys do? And you get this long meandering rambling thing. Have you, have you seen this day? Like this long rambling thing. And then they're going to go home. So they wasted this amazing opportunity where they could have spoken. I mean, they would have spoken to investors and giant customers and people who could have joined their team. But with, that, with a long rambling, um, it's a bit like my, my, my explanation of this, really, isn't it? Um, but with a long rambling uh, you know, set of words, you're, you're not able to get your message across. Um, anyway, so this is really, really important. And just another point about this. It shouldn't be, we will transform the world forever. Right? That's, that's like five words. But that's, that's nonsense. There's no content in that. What you want is... Something, well, yeah, I know, because <laughs> I'm standing out here. We will transform the world, dot, dot, dot. How about that? <laughs> Bit of mystery. <laughs> but, um, but what you want is something where they go, ah, that they can take, hold in their mind, and walk over to Jono, who knows about blockchain, and go, oh, this guy is doing Uber for dog food or something. They can, it's, it has to be something they can internalize and explain to someone, not this guy is changing the way that data interacts with people. Well, what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything, right? So it has to be something that, that, that explains your company. That's really important. You can't do this in five seconds. You've got to sit down, maybe with a couple of beers with your team and, and figure this out. And, and it's continually evolving, right? OK. The next is this. Move fast like someone has a gun to your head. That's the mindset. By the way, who, does anyone know what? Yes? Okay. That's right. <laughs> Turn your key, sir. <laughs> yep. Anyway, um, but this is, this is the mindset to have, right? This is the level of urgency and fear that you want to uh, cultivate in your mind. Okay, uh, so the, I've seen this in a, a lot of places, and, and, and this is absolutely not the case in the Valley. And that is people will protect their IP, which is fine, and then hold it back and not tell anyone. And I've seen this, I've seen this a lot here, and it's to people's detriment. Because do you, I don't know if this is going to work here, do you want to be the guy sitting here, look, he's not talking to anyone, his idea is completely safe. Wow, that's awesome. Or, look at this, do you want to be this guy? This guy's over here, and he's talking to lots of people, not necessarily about his secret source, but about, about the benefits, about what he's doing, what he's working on, maybe some stumbling blocks he has, and these guys are talking to him. And they're thinking about it and talking to him. They may end up being people who introduce them to someone. They may end up, I mean, I've listed here. They're going to ask awkward questions. Well, why can't you just use a piece of string, right? You know, or how come, how come, doesn't Google do that already with Dropbox, with, with, uh, with Google Drive? You know, like, oh, can't, why can't they use a whiteboard? Like, those sorts of awkward fundamental questions that you kind of know in the back of your head and you're in denial about. These people are asking it right now to this guy. So get all good questions and feedback from smart, experienced people. And that's how you recruit your team, customers, champions, and intros. So anyway, I've seen this a lot. And the tendency is to hold it and develop it in the dark. But that's not how ideas develop. 
because every idea is wrong. Every, every initial direction is wrong in ways that we know and ways that we don't know, right? It's like a landmine. You don't know where the landmines are. Okay. Uh, next, uh, I've heard the idea that, okay, you've got your product. Okay, now you go to Silicon Valley and get some angel funding and come back. That's not how it works. So you can only get Silicon Valley funding with two things, with traction, hope, ideally serious traction, and proximity, meaning you need to live there. At least your decision makers need to live there. Otherwise, yeah, uh, otherwise, um, <clears throat> well, investors want to drive to where their customers are, to where their, um, where their uh, in investments. investments are um, at any given time. So, so that's, that's why that, that's an issue. Um, and because I've seen this, that the people's uh, strategy is to, to go to the valley to get angel capital. And you actually need to be a lot further on. Ah, oh, so I've seen this, and uh, I'm sure a few of us in the room have seen this m many times. It's a common, uh, it's a, there's been a lot of uh, wasted opportunity from this. And that is giving control to emotional investors who don't understand your industry or your technology. And I've seen so many great companies, uh, you know, perhaps even some run by someone in this room. Let's unpause that. <laughs> you know, be, 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 um, um, be sabotaged by people, the wrong people being on the board and forcing bad decisions or early sales, God forbid. Um, anyway, uh, so case in point, let's pause it here for a moment or, or, or edit it out afterwards, at, back on the record. Anyway, so for various reasons, um, you, know, you, you want to avoid this. Um, anyway, this should be like a checklist for founders when they're doing deals to, to make sure. I mean, I've said here giving control, because if, they if they're not on the board, uh, that's fine, right? Um, it's only if, if they have control, you know, if, if they have some sort of con controlling interest that, that it can be an issue. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, so avoid the temptations of an early listing. Uh, I've, you know, usually uh, you know, a, a common, I mean, people in this room probably know this better than I, right? Um, but you know, the, the common thing is angel funding, and then you don't quite get Series A, it doesn't matter, and then you do a listing. Nothing wrong with listing, but if you do it too early, I actually took this from a WA stock that listed too early, and I won't tell you which one it is, but there's only, well, anyway. Actually, it look, they all look the same if they're too early, right? You know? It's public information. What's that? It is, it, this is public information, it is. Anyway, but you can see here, this is actually zero on the scale. This isn't, you know, like sometimes, you know, you ruin the thing where zero is actually here and you make it look really bad. No, that's actually, that's zero. Just so you know the level it fell to. Okay. Um, now this I've seen and that is when we expand, we're going to have, we have three products and we're going to go to these markets in these and we're going to do it all at the same time. And actually, right, uh, before you really know your customer, before you really have product market fit, you don't know, you, you don't know enough to know how to expand. And even if you did, you don't, you can't afford to go in all these different directions. You know, instead, the alternative, and I like to say this, I, I'm a strategy guy, right? So a lot of my, I have a lot of quotes go, go back to basic strategy is from this guy, right? 400, 544 BC. And he said, concentrate your forces at the point of impact, San Su. And that is, you take all of your talent and all of your capital and all the people you know and the experience and everything, and you focus it all into one tiny point. And that's how you, that's the laser focus that you take. You don't go out everywhere. You know, once, you've, once you absolutely own that laser focus, then you can go out elsewhere. But, but this, is the, this is the target for what you really want to do early on. And, and I've seen, I've seen uh, somehow a lot of this. And, and you, it, it, it sells good ideas short. Okay. Um, everyone says this, but I want to put some numbers behind it about thinking big. You want to figure out how to rationally c connect the dots to a point where you can, you're actually earning $100 million in recurring revenue by year five. You may not get there, but you want to figure out if you can't connect the dots with rational assumptions in a spreadsheet, and get to this point, then you're not, you're not, you haven't figured out your business model yet. I mean, 
early on everything's plus or minus 100% error, right? But still, you want to figure out a plan that reaches. If you run, you, if you run what you're thinking forward and you get to 2 million annual recurring revenue in year five, you're not doing it right. You really need to aim for something this aggressive. Because even if you're not successful, then um, you're at least you know, a much better place. Um, and also, the mere fact that you're thinking like this, it forces you to think in a non-linear way, which is, which is exactly what you need. You're thinking, well, look, right now I'm going up and I'm meeting, I'm signing up these companies, and that's everyone wants it, and that's great, but I'm never going to get to 100 million in five years. How do I do it? OK, I'm going to need channel partners. How do I get to channel partners? I can't reach them in time. OK, how will I do it? So it forces you to ha into different, a different kind of thought mode if you're ob obsessing about um, this target. OK, so I've seen this, and it's, well, mainly because I've been, my mindset's been in the, in the valley for a long time. And I'm, I think that there are, there are products and markets where New Zealand is an incredible opportunity. And I'm, I, and I'm really genuine when I say that. There, there's definitely opportunity in New Zealand. But generally speaking, it's a lot of effort for a tiny market. I mean, that's not necessarily the case. I mean, if you, can, if you could easily do it, if you, can, if you can conquer New Zealand with one guy and a rented office, do it, go ahead. But it's, it's a lot of effort and critical time loss on a tiny market if that's what the next success is predicated on. Better to beef up and go, if, if you've got your formula right, you want to explore a much larger market. Uh, any thoughts on this, by the way? Because I've seen it a couple of times, okay. two or three times. Yeah, OK, OK, so that's a given. All right, anyway, so, uh, and I've seen smart people come up with this. So that, that, that's why I, I put it in there. What makes you say that? <laughs> Okay. I mean, yeah. Oh, uh, right. Okay. Oh, well, there you are. Okay. Okay. So uh, that wasn't that re re that reasoning wasn't wasn't given to me. No. Um, okay. So. Exactly, and and if you can if you can do it concurrently, that's fine, you know. Uh, but it also depends on what resources you have. Yeah, if you can do it as an inexpensive practice run, th th then that's fine. But you don't want to de go deploying all of your resources to conquer. Similar enough to what you're doing right, to it's like like a, an, an example from antiquity, right? So I think at the height of the was it the Athenians, you know, at the, you know when, when, when Athens was at its, you know, at the height of its power, they decided, oh, you know what, let's just conquer little Sicily, just, just let's just do it. <laughs> and they, they led all of, the, all of this effort and everything, and then it just, conditions weren't good and it wiped them out. It's a long story why, you know, but it, uh, just one of those things. It took a lot of effort and they didn't end up doing it anyway, and then they lost almost everything. Australia a good market to test in develop Absolutely. <coughs> it's essential. Shake them, get your formula right, and then go, use that as an analogue to go across the US. It, it absolutely is. Right. I mean, the way I, the way I see this is that, um, you know, Australia is a, an incredible sand pit for learning and getting the, the formula right. Um, competitors are absolutely here. It looks, but they're not. You don't have, well, Google isn't paying as close attention as they are over in the valley. You know, there's... There's a tension that's paid here, but I, I, it's unlikely it's going to be as, as you know, you're not being scrutinized as closely. So you can learn your lessons and iterate more. You can talk to bigger customers, et cetera. So yeah, get the formula right and then go to the larger markets, so Asia, Europe, US. But do you see Australia as one market or several? Oh, it depends on the product, I guess. <coughs> yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. And if you've got that traction here, does Silicon Valley recognize that and, and give it merit? And they're happy to see that sort of traction there. 
No, yeah, I, that, that's that, that's the way it's happened. You know, I mean, and also e even in the U.S., you know, they they know that we're like Americans, but with a funny accent, right? <laughs> and no guns, <laughs> and we have a queen. You know, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so I think that you know that's that that's definitely regard. I mean, a lot of companies companies are going to the U.S. all the time with you know with runs on the board here, and then they just you know extrapolate that forward and and you know continue their their progress. Yeah, so, yeah, New Zealand, but not, yeah, yeah. This applies to New Zealand, um, a sub, you know, to a majority of New Zealand plans, not all of them. But, yeah, certainly Australia is a chance to, to really get that, get, learn your lessons before you go out. You know, I was mentioning this before. Uh, you know, it's almost like Australia is where the, the Australian market is, where Rocky's doing the training and there's the montage. He's getting really strong, you know, and then... He goes into the ring, which is the, the international markets where competitors are large and, and the pockets, you know, very deep pockets, you know, much more higher aggression, etc. Faster movement. Okay. <clears throat> now, this is about being different, <clears throat> but in a specific way. Uh, that is, so you want to be different, but in a dimension that customers care about. Uh, and again, th these aren't general observations about companies. These are general observations about WA companies that I've seen. And I want to make a point about what I, I, I want to flesh this out. So this is the status quo, say, and let's assume like this is the perceived value, right? So the status quo is there, all right. And the disruptors are there in purple. So that means that they're offering something that's, that's better than the status quo, that's great. And in theory, your venture is doing something a bit better, right? That's the mindset that you want. So you want to, you live in that delta. And the question is, do they value the delta? Because I've seen a lot of companies say, like when they value the market, they say, look what, look what we can do. Look, this is so valuable. And they talk about the purple area, which is fine, but that's not where they're special. They're special here. And so there's been a lot of, there's a lot of um, analysis. For, I mean, example, I saw a company that was doing anomaly detection in a specific area. And, there were, and the whole thrust of the company was saying, well, look how huge anomaly detection is. Look where it can be applied. So, therefore, blah, right? And, and that's, that, that is true of the purple area, but the question is, uh, you know, are you actually providing more perceived value? And do they, and do they value that? And, and I, I needed to draw this diagram to express what that means, because... Um, you want to be explaining the green bit, not the purple bit. And I have, I can flesh this out a bit more just to labor the point. Okay, say you have, you know, this is scenario A, and let's say this is the customer care threshold, right? So, as you, I, I like diagrams, right? So this is the customer care threshold, and clearly in this scenario, there's gonna be three scenarios, just get ready for them. In scenario A, the disruptors and your venture are irrelevant because they're already happy, right? They're already, so this is a horrible industry to be in. Um, it's a bit like, um, uh, like the car industry right now, you know? Everyone's more or less happy, it's just fine. You know, do you want, it, do you want what if there was a Perth Motors company starting up? Yeah, whatever, all right, but it's, everyone's more or less okay right now with, with, with cars. I mean, electric cars are something else. Anyway, that, that may or may not be a good example. But the point is, everyone is adequately satisfied and you don't need, you don't need anything else. Now, in this second example, the disruptors are absolutely killing it. Look at that. You know, they're leaving the, the status quo in the dust. But they don't care about, maybe you're making it a little bit faster and no one cares. Maybe you can tell, maybe you've got a ratings machine and you can tell within a millisecond what people are listening to. People don't really care about that level. Maybe they only care about one second level of resolution, and any more is uninteresting for them. They don't value it. So, you know, so therefore, you don't want to even be in this B, B category, because you know, clearly the customers care, you know, the, the disruptors are already adequately meeting. You want to be here, right? And you want to be in this category where your 10x, your delta is 10x what the status quo is. And you're actually doing something that is tangibly better than what the disruptors are doing. Anyway, that, that's my point. That's why I needed to do two slides to explain it to you. Oh, 
and so that's the one that's the one that we want, right? Okay, so um, this this is I've seen this, and I was also talking to others as well. Like, you want to be you want to be true to the lean startup methodology, and not just pay lip service to it. And specifically, what I mean is that you want to test the most critical risks with the minimum level of resources. That doesn't mean that you test something so you scale up this giant behemoth that's you know a million lines of code to test something. It, you can just test it with like a calling up a customer, speaking to a customer and saying, "What do you think about this?" You know, or what if, uh, you know, showing them a wireframe and so, or asking, in the past, when you've needed a loan. I'm just making this up on the fly. In the past, when you've needed a loan, what were the options you looked at? Or did, what, did, what did you do? And just by asking questions, that's the easiest way of validating. And then it's, it's wireframes. But you don't need to deploy a huge amount of engineering. And early on, every extra um, level of engineering is an extra burden <laughs> to your speed and to learning. Because what matters most is, is learning, is, is speed and, and learning. You've got to learn fast. And like I said, you're, in, you're wrong in all sorts of ways that you can imagine and that you can't imagine. You don't even know the assumptions that you're making, is what I'm saying. OK, and I've got a quote here from Blackbird, because <laughs> I thought it was interesting. Um, no Perth stockbrokers. And I know exactly what they mean. This is, this is to this point, right? Oh, are there any Perth stockbrokers here in the room? <laughs> Not officially, anyway. OK. And that's, this is what I mean, OK? So smart investors back ventures that create, iterate, and own their own IP. Because I've seen two things here. I've seen, and by the way, Exact Steel, this company I was originally part of, we didn't own our own IP. We had, a, we had some IP, but we licensed it from somewhere. And by the way, so if that had gone forward, we would have had to bulk up our engineering and, I don't know, buy it out. And anyway, that's a brief aside. So I'm guilty of this as well. But investors want to back ventures, ideally, that own their own IP, at least for rocket ships. There's probably a lot of examples for lifestyle businesses where that's not the case. But if you're trying to build a rocket ship, you really need to attract smart investors that own their own IP. Um, and also create it and iterate it. And the only way you can do that is with an engineering team. You know, so, and, and here I'm fleshing this out. So this isn't a single one-off punt on an invention. Because generally speaking, unless it's the cure for cancer, it's not a single, you know, in an, the product isn't a single point, right? It's a landscape, and it's called product management. So it's, conti it's a continual and additive and iterative process. So you need a team that's going to be able to onboard new information and iterate with it, um, yeah, and adapt to new, new customer and industry information. Um, so funnily enough, there's a lot of yeah, licensing, licensing of other technology, or a person or a company is creating their own IP, and then they start a new shell, and they raise money for the shell, and they license, they license the technology from their other company, so they're offering stuff that doesn't actually own the IP. Now, I've heard here that that can work, but I don't think it works for rocket ships. I haven't seen it. This doesn't happen in the Valley. Um, and I've just said it. The gods of success favor creators who can adapt, not licensees. Uh, there's probably a lot of successful examples in Perth of, 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 of licensing. I, and I'm open to uh, hearing how that's, how that's, there's no, there's been no success. Oh, that's interesting to know. Anyone have any successful examples of licensing? That's interesting. Okay. Because it's not a single point, right? You want to actually have a team that can iterate. Oh, yeah. Have you got one? What's your comment about no stockbroker? Oh, because a stockbroker, yeah, what I mean there is, and what Nick Crocker meant is, You've got an eye, you, you see some technology, you license it, and then you're raising capital, and then you're going to reverse list it. Like you do all of this stuff with no actual ownership of IP, without an engineering team. So Maybe you comment about stockbrokers or about Perth stockbrokers? I guess Perth stockbrokers. Right? I thought he said West Perth stockbrokers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is it say, does he say West Perth? Yeah. Don't even bring up. <laughs> All right, I didn't see West Perth. I saw, oh, right, there you are. Yeah, because I think there's a, they're probably contacted a lot by 
guys who want to reverse, like there's a university spin out, they grab it, they license it, and then they want to reverse it, back it into a reverse listing, make a lot of money. And I, I was actually, okay, let's just. Come and talk to New Year about that. What's that? Come and talk to New Year about that. Yeah, oh, right. Yeah, you probably had a few dodgy guys approaching you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See. <laughs> yeah. See. So Dave, Dave's company is a perfect example of of listing at the right time, right? You know that was. You know that's not too early. That's that's like a that's a positive case study. Yeah. Now I've seen it. Oh yeah. So if we pause it now, I'll just tell you. So I was I was a million times. You know all of your code, like you know for. A, like, Dave, I'm picking on you again, right? Is any code left from your version one? Like, it's probably all rewritten, well, I think, right? I think what I can say is that we are targeting a very different customer to the customer we were, we were targeting right. two years ago with a different value proposition and a different way to market. And, and I think that happens with all early stage technology companies. But, you know, you, you have to iterate. I think your yep. point is absolutely valid. You, you've got to be versatile. Yep. You've, got to, you've got to be able to move quickly. And you've got to be able to iterate quickly. Because there's no straight path. No, no. It's just, it's just a fact of life. Yeah, and everything's true. Even when you finally, un like the, the, the market is in flux as well. It isn't like, finally I understand the customer. That's it. Now we can relax. Fire all of the marketing people. <laughs> Forget, stop Google Analytics. <laughs> we know everything now. <laughs> no, it's, it's not the case. It's, it's a... It's a complex, dynamic, changing. I have another slide set for that. You know, it's a complex, dynamic, changing beast. It's multidimensional and nuanced. And it's the same cost. exactly right. Mm -hmm. And that's it. So now it's question time. Oh. Sure, sure. You've got like a backlog of features that, and you're waiting where they, yeah, what comes next. Oh well, you 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 definitely you want to you want to do, you you want to distill it all into, you know, the first conversation you have, or when someone's, oh, what are you working on, yeah, right? Yeah, this is the, like the fifth conversation. Oh, okay, the fifth conversation. Yeah, Oh, by the fifth? I don't, I don't know where, where you're up to with the fifth conversation. But, but I mean, what you're talking about, that's, <clears throat> at that point, you can, you know, you're, you're talking about different places the, the product can go, different markets it can, you can explore. You know, so that, that's really fleshing out your go-to-market, I, I assume. But well, maybe you can get quite far with version one. Like, you know, who, who's to say, like, you know, you, you want to, I mean, this is, uh, you know, you, you want to have the customers decide what the next features are. You know, just say which of the features where if, if they're not in, you'll, sc you'll scream, yeah. right? That, that way, or which, which of these 10 have to be in? And which, which, which one has to be in? And ask everyone. And then that way you'll, you'll rank them up by voting and then the, the things they really care about will bubble. Otherwise, if you give it all of them to tick, they'll tick all of them, <laughs> always. <laughs> oh yeah, Richard? Mike, um, 
the Lean Startup talks about the minimum viable product, which is a very key concept. But a few years ago, I came across something which I don't claim to, to own, but it was a lovely concept called the minimum lovable product, mm -hmm. which puts it back onto the customer, what the customer's going to love, as opposed to what you may think is the minimum viable product that you sell. Have you, what's your experience in Silicon Valley and in your general experience about <coughs> minimum uh, viable product, which sounds like what Andy was thinking, like, how do you over, it's very easy to over-engineer something and add in more features than what the customer actually cares about. And as you talked about before, what the customer cares about, you may be off track with anyway. But what's your what's your experience with uh, minimum viable product and, and this other concept which you may not have come across, the minimum lovable product? Well, I, I've heard of other analogous things, right? But, but usually MVP, everyone's got a different definition. You know, Eric Ries has, well, he created it, so he has a definition. But generally, the, the idea is it's the minimum that's viable. Like the minimum lovable is really just MVP, right? You know, like the question of where that line is, what is the line? And in whose perception it is. Right, but it's got to be, it's always got to be the customers. Yeah, minimum viable you know? is not necessarily with a customer focus, whereas lovable tends to have a customer focus. R right. Uh, but I mean, if, you, if, you, if you're an Eric Reese purist, right, a lean startup purist, you know, the minimum viable is, it's the minimum to validate the highest risk. And if the highest risk is, I don't think they're going to come back. Like, I, I'm worried they're going to log in. You know, so you want to test that. That's the minimum viable product. And the next minimum viable product is, I'm worried that, um, that they'll stay on the site, you know, and, and actually register or, or whatever. That's the minimum viable product. And the next thing is, I don't, I'm worried they're not going to come back. So you're testing the trigger, right? So each of those is the minimum viable product. So you know, in that case, it's, that is a minimum lovable product, you know, because you're just you're just testing. At a certain point, then there's a, a product that they can interact with. But but really, you're you're rolling out the minimum necessary to test the highest risk. You know, that's that's the that's the MVP. So they're the same. I, I would Eric Reese would argue. Uh -huh. You, yeah, if you, if you want Silicon Valley funding, then you need to, to be there. Decision makers need to be there. So investors, that's the big thing. Uh, no, no that, that's not the case. Um, because in Silicon Valley, you've got, you, know, you have investors, and not just like a lot of money, you have some of the smartest people on the planet are investors. And so the value they bring is immense. And, and because they're smart and because they've invested in Google and uh, God forbid Snapchat, that's, that, that's probably zero learning, I don't know. That's my pet hate, that one, Un <laughs> cut that bit out. Um, but you know, because they've invested in some of the most iconic companies, they, the smartest people have the most incredible experiences. You know, it's, it's, it's logarithmic, right? So you're, you're compounding these things. So, okay, so it's sm super smart capital, but then you've also got the people who've created the technology we use every day are still around, they're still young, and you can meet them for a coffee, right? So, so it's talent as well. And then it's customers. And customers are people who've seen their business or prior businesses they've, they've controlled be transformed by technology, and so they're willing to do a POC. They're willing to sit down and talk with you. They know that a couple of guys in their mum's garage can completely disrupt their way of life or their, their, their way of business. Uh, and could or could put them out of business, right? So there is there is tremendous regard for that. So it's it's capital, talent, um, customer willingness to to adopt. Um, Can I add one thing? Yeah. I would describe it as the oxygen of inspiration. Yeah. Yeah. And that is you're surrounded by incredible people that all think they can change the world, and you breathe yeah. that every day. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's infectious. You, you just can't ignore it. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, what, yeah. Some of us move the curtain in that case. <laughs> yeah, right. But, uh, no, but, yeah, no. It's, I think that's summarized it in my mind. Yeah. It's just an incredibly inspirational ecosystem. Yeah. And, and culture. Yeah. yeah, so we're, we're meeting here right now. And actually, for the first time ever since I, I know I've ever 
from the first time ever, that, to my knowledge, there's another entrepreneurial event happening right now at SERI. Right? So that's, that, that's, and that's a good sign. That's a sign that the Perth ecosystem is, is maturing, that there's, there's things, I mean, it would be nice if they, you know, you know, you know, figured out you know, a schedule better. They, Charlie, they need, your, they need to figure out your, your calendar, right? Yeah? Anyway, so, but that, that, that's, a, that's a good sign. In the Valley, every moment, I always like to say, there are, there are probably five unmissable events that you have to attend at any given time. And, and they're all at the same time. And, and, and so you'll, you're going to miss out on everything, like on, on things necessarily. Um, and every, so we're here, and there's there's thing happening at Seri right now, but in the valley, every building at this time is filled with these sort of conversations. And during the day and at night, every cafe and every bar has people who are sitting down with a laptop that either has PowerPoint and they're pitching to someone or talking about a deck or they're coding or they have a spreadsheet and they're working on a model, right? And it's everywhere. Everyone is here. The conversations we're having are it's like a niche conversation. There, that is the conversation, you know. Anyway, that's, yeah, so to, to Dave's point. Yes? Completely random. It's just, if you, could, if you could afford to leave this, or I guess you're, what you're saying is really, a lot of this means you are living there participating. You, you must be well validated and quite financially valuable and quite financially independent to afford to make that leap of faith. Or you've spent the two years on the cat in many ways that it's valuable to just put sticks and shift your team over there, shift your family over there, move your life over there. Uh, is, that, is that a question? Well, so, or? so, so mm -hmm. yeah, I, mean, I, I guess it, I'm, I'm trying to drill into your observation that you go tap into Silicon Valley, but you're only getting invested if you've got traction. I guess the underlying question is, is if you could afford to go there, do you really need the money? Oh, I see. Yeah, because to really, like, say you go there for your Series A, I mean, you know, say it's a 10 million investment, that's, that's the kind of rocket fuel, and it's called rocket fuel, right? That's the kind of rocket fuel that you can't easily get through cash flow. You can have intergenerational wealth here with a restaurant, say, and maybe you're making 500,000, a million a year with, with a restaurant. That's not the same money that you can just throw on a venture and, and watch that, you know, to turn that engine and, and really make it, you know, fly. So that that that's why it's a different it's a different kind of money, and that's capital, of course. That investors are saying, I may not, I may never see this again, but I do want 10x on it if you can if you can help it, and we'll help you with it. So it's that kind of it's that kind of money. It's not your whole family's life savings on 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 a, on a punt. So different. So it's a different kind of money, a different kind of risk return profile. There's an order of magnitude difference yep. there, I think, in the value they bring with intelligence and knowledge yep. and network mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. at that right stage. But I think the comment around the angels was that because angels tend to want to be quite active and involved, um, you know, if, if you're trying to go there for angel money and be based here, they don't have that sensitivity to be involved and hands on and ads, so that doesn't actually work. Um, but the other comment, the other thing we talked about too was that, um, you know, it's not my bit I don't think it's an overnight it's about building that relationship so yeah. it's about going over there and starting to get connected and not rocking up on the doorstep and being there for ding ding asking for money it's more like let's go across and start to get to know people and then they see you progressing as well so maybe it's where you go back and forth for a year or 80 months or two years and then you, you've you, got the traction absolutely you've got, you got the connections and then be asking for the right level of money in that place plays out yeah and you know you, you want to start those conversations I mean it's harder if you're here probably but you can go across for a conference or something, I don't know. Um, you want to start those conversations when you don't need the money. It's like, hi, I just want to meet with you, let you know what we're doing. You know, that's, that's the game you play. It's like when, you, when you're dating or something, you never call it a date, you call it a coffee, you know? <laughs> I don't know if that's, you know, I, don't, I haven't dated for 10 years, I don't know how it works anymore. But, but you know, you never call it a date, right? It's a coffee, we're gonna meet for coffee, what's the, you know? And it's the same thing with an investor, you go, no, 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 I just want to tell you what we're up to, you know? <laughs> you sit down, oh, no, what are you looking for? Oh, no, but look, no we're not looking, we're just, I just want to get some feedback from you about what we're doing, you know? <laughs> so it's that kind of, <laughs> it's that kind of dating game that you play. And then, you know, the proviso there is that you are then getting traction, and then they're in, they're, these guys are thinking, every time I see that guy or girl, every time I see them, they're coming back, they, they said they would do A, B, and C, they did A, B, C, and D. 
these guys are red hot. I'm going to remember these. And when they come back again and they validate that, that understanding of where you are, you know, that's all self-reinforcing. So when it comes time to go, oh, are you interested? We're closing around. We'd love for you to be part of it. Boom. They've already seen that you know, you've, they've got a few points where you've really shown that you've nailed all of those traction points. And the coachability through that, that journey in relationship That's right. as well. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, it's getting late. So um, can we all thank Mike very, very much? Thanks, guys. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Oh, lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.